The Complete History of Competitive Singles Pokemon in Generation 8 From November 15th, the release date of Pokemon Sword and Shield, to November 17th, 2022, one day before the release date of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. From controversies to Pokemon bans to DLCs, we're going to talk about important events that happened, how the metagame evolved, and what were the best Pokemon and strategies to use at each stage of the metagame. Competitive singles Pokemon is played on Pokemon Showdown, a Pokemon simulator, and not in the actual games. The main reason is that simulators are easier. You can build teams easily and you don't have to spend hundreds of hours breeding a team. The convenience factor alone is massive. Singles Pokemon on Pokemon Showdown is governed unofficially by an entity known as Smogon. Smogon is not affiliated with Nintendo in any way, but once upon a time, people wanted to play 6v6 competitive Pokemon, and Smogon started making rule sets for how to do it. Pokemon is not a game designed for competitive singles play for the most part. It's meant as a single player experience, and if anything, it's balanced for the official competitive double format known as VGC. That means that there may be things that are unplayable or overpowered, and Smogon defines a rule set to ban those things. You don't have to follow Smogon rules, but there's a reason people do. They're a de facto authority because the rules are generally good. One of the key concepts of Smogon is a concept of a tiering system. Standard play is known as the OU tier, where most Pokemon are allowed. Above that is the Ubers tier, where if Pokemon or strategies are overpowered in standard play, they get banned from standard play and are only available in the Ubers tier. Most cover legendaries or Pokemon of that general power level are in the Ubers tier. Very rarely a Pokemon may be so powerful that it's overpowered even amongst the tier meant for overpowered Pokemon. In that rare situation, that Pokemon would get banned from Ubers and only be available in a format called Anything Goes, which has no rules. This has happened in the past to Mega Rayquaza and Zacian. Smogon also maintains the usage rate of Pokemon in each tier. Pokemon that are not used a lot in the OU tier get bumped down to the UU tier, and Pokemon not used enough in the UU tier get bumped down to the tier below it called the RU tier, and so on and so forth. The idea is that every Pokemon should have a format or tier where they can fight against other Pokemon of a similar power level. The key is that there's no central dictator telling people what is good and what is bad and assigning tiers. The tiers are based on how often people use the Pokemon. People play to win, so the best Pokemon get used the most often and the tiering system forms a natural hierarchy where people vote with their actions. This video will be focused on the OU tier which is the main tier. With all the groundwork out of the way, let's head to Day 1 of Generation 8, November 14th, 2019. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel. It's free and doesn't cost you anything and helps out the channel a lot. If you want to see more competitive Pokemon content, this is the right place to be. We start with Day 1, the beginning of the Dynamax era. There were a lot of changes from Generation 7. The elephant in the room is Dynamax, but we'll get to that later. First, Hidden Power and Pursuit were removed from the game. A big part of Tyranitar's kit was Pursuit, and it was a big blow to Tyranitar. Generally speaking, it also meant that Ghost and Psychic-type Pokemon got a little better. The lack of Hidden Power meant that a lot of Pokemon lost coverage, but it also meant defense could be a little more reliable. You wouldn't have to worry about a random Hidden Power surprising you anymore. Heavy Duty Boots was also a new item that was massive for singles, a metagame that revolves around hazards. Switching is very common in competitive singles Pokemon. In-game, when you have a Fire-type versus a Grass-type, the AI is going to stay in and die, but other human players know to switch out. As a result, Stealth Rock is important to rack up damage because switching is very common and very important. Now, you could put Heavy Duty Boots on any Pokemon weak to Stealth Rock. But people didn't quite realize how truly effective Heavy Duty Boots could be until a later era. For now, it was just an item good on Stealth Rock weak Pokemon. But besides all of that, the biggest change was Dexit and the lack of Pokemon Home. Basically, entering Generation 8, a lot of Pokemon were removed from the Sword and Shield Pokedex entirely. They would be completely unobtainable, like Greninja. This was known as Dexit. Also, Pokemon Home was not available yet. Pokemon Home was a way to transfer Pokemon from an older game to Pokemon Sword and Shield. 
With no way to transfer Pokemon from previous games yet, it meant that from the Pokemon that were available, they didn't have a lot of good moves from the older generations and they could only use moves available in Sword and Shield. For example, Weavile didn't have Knock Off, Clefable didn't have Soft Boiled, and a lot of Pokemon didn't have Toxic. Pokemon Home would come out eventually, but for now, you had limited move pools. Pokemon Showdown is relatively fast and gets the server up and running on the same day as the release date, usually almost immediately. There are always a few bugs here and there, but as new information comes in, the server constantly rolls out patches. At the beginning of Generation 8, the new mechanic Dynamax was implemented immediately and mistakes were fixed on the same day. For example, on day 1, the boost from Choice Band was applied while Dynamax, which isn't actually true, and that had to be fixed. But overall, it does get very reliable, very fast. But there was actually a different day 1 controversy. Sleep Clause Sleep is widely recognized to be overpowered. Being able to stop your opponent from moving is absolutely huge. There are ways to play against it, like Grass-type Pokémon, Electric Terrain, or Safety Goggles, but it becomes really limiting to team building when you absolutely need to use those on your team. Paradox of banning stuff, and it's why competitive singles Pokémon has bans in the first place. We'll get to the good stuff like the best Pokémon and strategies, but it's important to understand why stuff gets banned. If you don't ban anything, on paper you have more options in a literal sense. But in practice, you have less options. Overpowered strategies become the only thing worth using, because why would you use anything different? Metagames become very linear and revolve around only using the overpowered strategies and the ways that can beat it. It limits a lot of the team building. Sleep is one such overpowered strategy and has traditionally been limited by something known as Sleep Clause. Competitive Pokemon singles has a sleep clause where you can only put one Pokemon to sleep at a time. The rule comes from Pokemon Stadium, which had a sleep clause because evidently even they knew how broken it was. To illustrate the point, if you look at Generation 7 Anything Goes, which was a format with no clauses or bans at all, Vivillon is actually usable amongst all those legendary Pokemon because it has an accurate sleep powder and quiver dance. That's how good sleep is. Unfortunately, there's a problem with Sleep Clause. It's not cartridge accurate, and in other words, it means it can't be implemented in the actual game. A big part of being a simulator is that you're as true to the actual games as possible. Smogon provides a rule set. If a Pokemon is banned, you and your opponent can agree not to bring that Pokemon, and that's possible to do in the physical game. With respect to Sleep Clause, you and your opponent can agree to not intentionally sleep more than one Pokemon but that doesn't account for edge cases like Effect Spore or somebody encoring you into Spore, just to name a few. Sleep Clause cannot be truly implemented on the actual games. If you inadvertently sleep a second Pokemon in the actual game, you can't tell the game to undo it. However, Sleep Clause had been running on Pokemon simulators for decades now and it was a part of the gameplay at this point. On day 1 of Generation 8, when everything gets unbanned for a fresh start, they also removed Sleep Clause, with the intent of banning Sleep entirely, instead of a half measure that violates the in-game mechanics. Nobody liked that decision. There was a lot of backlash for trying to fix something that wasn't broken. The idea being that Sleep Clause had been running for a long time, who cares? Smogon is unofficial anyway, and Sleep Clause works well enough. And just like that, after the backlash, Sleep Clause was re-implemented on day one. My personal opinion is that removing Sleep Clause is a pretty good idea, and Sleep should just be banned outright, but it looks like I'm on the minority in that one. In any case, with Day 1 in the books, and most of the major mechanical issues fixed, it was time for the actual metagame. As you might expect, Dynamax was fundamentally the main focus of everything. Dynamax was not created with competitive singles in mind. Maybe it's fine in a 4v4 doubles format, but it was unstoppable in singles. We'll get to why that is, but there was actually something just as powerful. Gothitelle. Shadow Tag is arguably one of the most broken abilities in the game. Being able to isolate Pokemon, trap them, and then remove them is huge in a game like Pokemon that revolves around team synergy. Having important Pokemon get picked off is basically unplayable. It fits well on stall teams where it can be used to trap and remove stallbreaker Pokemon. 
Shadow Tech has been banned in every single generation, but at the beginning of Generation 8, it was given a fresh shot. However, in the early days, Gothitel stalls were just as potent as they had always been. Everybody already knew how overpowered they could be, and nothing fundamentally changed, so they made a decision to quick ban Shadow Tag. Shadow Tag was banned instead of Gothitel, because interestingly, Eviolite Gotharita is just as good, so it made more sense to ban the fundamental ability. Most bans are done through a public vote, which I'll get into later, but quick bans are reserved for obvious bans where time doesn't need to be wasted on a whole voting procedure. In a quick ban, the OU Council, which is a group of the best players, vote amongst themselves to ban something. So on day 4, even before Dynamax was banned, Shadow Tag was banned and Gothitelle's strategies were nerfed. Dynamax could turn already powerful Pokémon into devastating attackers. Dynamax Pokémon would get 3 straight turns of boosted attacks as well as any secondary effects while also being immune to moves like Roar. Not many regular Pokémon can take on a Dynamax Pokémon for 3 turns in a row. Games would end up getting decided by who gets their 3 turns of Dynamax right, no matter how well you play the rest of the game. Dynamax was that game-breaking. It was basically supercharging your already best Pokémon. While it's true that you can Dynamax yourself to stop your opponent's Dynamax, the margin of error is very small. If you do it one turn too late, the Dynamax Pokémon can spiral out of control. If you do it too early, you might just waste your Dynamax entirely. Even then, defensive Dynamaxes don't always work out. The best example is a Pokémon like Moxie, Dragon Dance, Gyarados. Once that Gyarados Dynamaxes, it's going to be incredibly strong with Dynamax Water and Flying type attacks. When you defensive Dynamax, you're not even trying to beat Gyarados. You're only trying to hold on for two turns and hope you have a chance afterwards, which is really unlikely. Dynamax reactively puts you at a disadvantage because a turn where they Dynamax could be enough to net a game-winning kill. Ditto became a top Pokémon purely because it could copy powerful Pokémon and Dynamax itself. In fact, Dynamax era Gen 8 OU is the only time ever where Ditto has been a popular Pokémon. It's always been a fringe option at best. Usable, but fringe. To combat Pokémon like Choice Scarf Ditto, Palucha became a powerful sweeper with Dynamax Thunder Punch and an Electric Seed. The key here is that Halucha has Unburden, so it gets a speed boost. When Ditto copies Halucha, it doesn't get that unburdened speed boost because Ditto itself would have an item. That way, Halucha can always outspeed a Ditto trying to copy it. Any Pokémon that could Dynamax effectively was instantly good. Corviknight could use Bulk Up and then Dynamax for either speed with Dynamax flying or attack with Dynamax fighting off of Body Press. Corviknight was also good overall because of its defensive utility. Outside of being a Dynamax Pokémon, Steel plus Flying is a good type and Corviknight has good defensive stats and Roost. Excadrill could Swords Dance and Dynamax too. Its Steel and Ground type Dynamaxes could boost its defenses and its Rock Dynamax could give it Sand Rush. Besides explicit Dynamax threats, other top Pokémon were Dragapult because of its speed and versatility, and Darmanitan, Galar, and Dracovish because of their sheer power. Teams were built around facilitating number one Dynamax, and number two these powerful attackers. The best defensive Pokémon were Ferrothorn and Toxapex. There was a slight detour in the middle of all this Dynamax talk. Moody was unbanned on November 28th because in Generation 8 it didn't boost evasion anymore. It should have been put on the stuff that was unbanned day 1 because it deserved a chance to be tested because it was nerfed. It was overlooked at the time. However, even Moody without evasion was still completely crazy and it was re-banned again in less than 2 weeks with a quick ban. Eventually the time came to make a decision on Dynamax. Should it be banned? The vast majority of people viewed it as completely overpowered. There was an argument that a generation's core mechanics, like Z-Moves of Generation 7 and now Dynamax of Generation 8, should always not be banned because it defines the generation, but people didn't consider that too compelling. If you're trying to make a competitive game, it doesn't really matter if it's a defining mechanic. If it's overpowered, it should still be banned. Just to be clear, this is different from Sleep Clause because it can be enforced in the actual game. You and your opponent would simply agree to not Dynamax. 
A public vote called a suspect test was held to ban Dynamax. Typically, Pokemon are banned in Smogon metagames through the use of a suspect test. If you get certain stats on the Pokemon Showdown ladder to prove your competency, you get a vote on whether or not something should be banned. Things that are obviously overpowered, like the aforementioned Shadow Tag, get banned directly to save time. You don't need to waste time on a vote if it's obvious that vote would lead to a ban anyway. Similarly, it was actually pretty obvious that Dynamax would get banned, but it was held for a public vote because of the significance of it. To ban the generation's defining mechanic, it had to be the public collectively deciding it, not a cabal of insiders banning it on their own. In the end, the public voted and Dynamax was banned with an 87% majority, and one month and two days after release date, it was officially the end of the Dynamax era of competitive singles Pokemon. Next was the pre-Pokemon Home era. Dynamax was banned on December 16th, 2019, and Pokemon Home would come out in February of 2020. Pokemon Home would restore a lot of movesets for a lot of Pokemon. It was more about biding time until then. The first order of business was Darmanitan Galar. Darmanitan Galar was extremely powerful even during the Dynamax era, but it wasn't a priority to deal with when Dynamax was running around. To explain Darmanitan Galar in more detail, Darm had the ability Guerrilla Tactics which is basically a free choice band. Because you're already locked into a move, you might as well go for either a Choice Scarf or a Choice Band too. Choice Scarf meant that Darmanitan basically had both a Choice Scarf and a Choice Band at the same time. Choice Banded Darmanitan on the other hand would have two Choice Bands leading to an effective 2.25 times increase in power. This is already on a Pokemon with base 140 attack. With that much raw power, Darmanitan Galar turned into one of the most deadly Pokemon of all time. Icicle Crash did big damage to anything that didn't resist it, and it had Earthquake to hit Toxapex or could simply throw off a powerful U-turn if the time was right. Ice is a relatively good offensive type, being super effective versus four key types, and it's only bad defensively. Darm's main weakness was Stealth Rock and its lack of defense, but who cares? The payout for figuring out ways to get Darm into the game safely is well worth it. There is almost nothing that can take on a Choice Banded Darmanitan, it's way too strong. Eventually, Darmanitan Galar was directly banned on December 29th, 2019 without a public vote, similar to Shadow Tag. Time was of the essence because Smogon Premier League was also starting that week. Smogon Premier League is one of the yearly elite tournaments and it takes place roughly at the beginning of the year. Smogon Premier League was basically the only notable event in the pre-Pokemon Home era. Premier Leagues, or any important tournament for that matter, tend to spur on innovation as people get more motivated to find the best strategies. The pre-Pokemon Home metagame was characterized by Clefable plus Corviknight bulky team compositions. Dragapult was the premier offensive Pokemon in the tier because of its high speed and versatility. Not many Pokemon could even reach Dragapult's speed tier. It could go straight for attacks with Choice Specs Draco Meteor and Shadow Ball, or it could use movesets like Will-O-Wisp and Hex. Other dragons like Nasty Plot Hydreigon or Ficious Ren Dracobish were also common. Clefable is already an amazing Pokemon in its own right. Magic Guard and a good move pool and typing means it can do almost anything. It can use Wish to support its teammates, Calm Mind and Flamethrower to become a sweeper, and overall it's very versatile. The best attacking Pokemon at the time being Dragon types meant that Clefable saw a lot of usage as one of the few good fairy type Pokemon. Clefable naturally formed bulky cores with Corviknight and Seismitoad who all complement each other. Seismitoad's high usage is pretty funny when you think about it. It's ordinarily not a Pokemon that's used a whole lot, but the perfect storm of being the best Dracovish counter, synergizing well with Clefable and Corviknight, and the lack of competition from Dexit made Seismitoad a highly used Pokemon. Nasty Plot Discharge Rotom Heat with Heavy Duty Boots became a popular way to attack the Clefable plus Corviknight core, because Discharge would also be threatening to Pokemon like Hydreigon who might want to try and switch in. At this point in time, there weren't a lot of fast, backbreaking threats, and games were more methodical. It was more about wearing down the opponent and positioning your strong and bulky attackers like Aegislash and Hydreigon. Sand remained a staple because of how good it is overall, but Exodrill is walled completely by Body Press Corviknight, which is a limiting factor and prevented it from being overpowered. On February 11th, 2020, 
Pokemon Home was released and started the next chapter. Pokemon Home did a few important things. It gave players access to Pokemon with their old moves, thereby vastly expanding the options each Pokemon had. There are way too many additions to talk about, but broadly, a lot more Pokemon got knockoff, a lot more Pokemon got toxic, and certain important Pokemon like Togekiss and Hydreigon also got roost. Defog, an HM in Generation 4, is also valuable for giving a lot of Pokemon access to hazard control. Defog removes all hazards, which is a critical part of singles gameplay. Finally, Pokemon Home also gave access to not all, but certain new Pokemon. They appeared to have released access to some new Pokemon with Home, with the intention to release others during the future Sword and Shield DLCs. The new Pokemon were arguably the biggest deal. There were interesting new options like Shell Smash Blastoise, Alolan Ninetales with Aurora Veil, vale, Kyurem, Necrozma, Terrakion, and Zerora, which was exactly one point faster than Dragapult. However, it also added Pokemon that were overpowered and needed to get banned. Kyurem Black and Melmetal were both quick banned three days after Pokemon Home was released, on February 14th, 2020. Kyurem Black, despite its raw power and insane stats, used to be available in standard play. It didn't actually have a good physical ice move to take advantage of its base 170 attack stat. But in Generation 8, it got access to Dragon Dance, Icicle Spear, and the item Heavy Duty Boots. Kyurem Black was always a monster with an Achilles heel, but once that Achilles heel was removed, it was a no-brainer to ban it. Melmetal was a newer Pokemon, but incredibly strong too. Double Iron Bash has a 51% chance to flinch, so versus defensive Pokemon that are slower than Melmetal, it becomes a tough job to face. Melmetal is also incredibly tanky and can easily take on hits from Pokemon faster than it. Alongside Double Iron Bash, it also had Iron Fist Thunder Punch to do large damage to water types like Toxapex. In the context of the pre-DLC metagame, Melmetal was too strong and bulky relative to its competition. But this is not the end of Melmetal, we're going to be hearing a lot more from them later. There was also another problem creeping up, Arena Trap with Dugtrio. Arena Trap is also banned in every generation it's available in except in Generation 3. It works in fundamentally the same way as Shadow Tag, with the main difference being that Arena Trap is worse because it can't trap non-grounded Pokemon. Trapping is overpowered is a general opinion. Dugtrio and Arena Trap were given a fair shot because you can't really ban something based on how it was in Generation 7 or earlier. Just because something was overpowered in an earlier generation doesn't mean it would be overpowered in Generation 8. There was actually criticism that they were taking too long for the Arena Trap ban. But there were so many fundamental shifts in the metagame, from the ban of Dynamax to Pokemon Home, that there was never the time to take a clean look at Arena Trap. But after the release of Pokemon Home, there was a lot of time before the next metagame shift, so it made sense to look to ban Arena Trap. Banning Arena Trap wasn't really time sensitive, so it made sense to give it a proper public suspect test vote. That itself sparked some controversy because the quick ban would have been faster, but in any case, unsurprisingly, Arena Trap was banned with an 84.8% majority. After that, there were some loose ends to tie up. Melmetal was quick banned earlier with Kyurem B, but it was banned with the intention of giving it a fair shot later with a public vote. The public voted decisively that it was still overpowered, and it stayed banned in the public vote with a 62% vote for Melmetal to stay banned. Melmetal will still come back later in the story, so don't forget about them. The metagame was fundamentally similar to the pre-Pokemon Home metagame. The metagame was still dominated by Dragapult, Clefable, and Corviknight. There were just more helper Pokemon available. If you wanted a faster Pokemon, you no longer only had Dragapult as an option. You could use Zerora too if you wanted something different. If you wanted some more attacking options, you had Terrakion and Kyurem. Primarina was a good Calm Mind substitute sweeper because it can actually beat Toxapex 1v1. Before the next DLC would drop, there were some other changes too. Dracovish was banned because of its Fisher's Ren moveset. Dracovish's Fisher's Ren with Strong Draw is quite literally one of the strongest moves ever. Nothing can take it on. Every team had to use a Water Absorb Pokemon like Seismitoad only because of Dracovish. With a public vote, 90% of people voted to ban Dracovish on June 1st, 2020. Then, on the next day, on June 2nd, the starter Pokemon got their hidden abilities. 
Unfortunately, Antillion wasn't too relevant, but Cinderace and Rillaboom got massive upgrades. Cinderace got Libero, which is equivalent to Protean. Protean is an incredible ability and is what got Greninja banned in Generation 6. A fast Pokemon that has a stab boost on every attack is very difficult to handle, and Cinderace benefits from having heavy duty boots, which means it can pivot in and out with its powerful U turn. Rillaboom got Grassy Surge, which sets up Grassy Terrain. Setting up terrain is valuable for team support, but Rillaboom also helps its own Grassy Glide. Overnight, Rillaboom became a dangerously strong attacker that also had speed through the form of Grassy Glide's priority. The meta settled down for the next two weeks, this time without every team needing Seismitoad on it. Rillaboom was looking really solid, and Cinderace was looking ominously good. Then, on June 17th, the first DLC would come out and begin the DLC 1 era. DLC 1, Isle of Armor, added a huge number of returning Pokemon and would drastically change the metagame and start the new era. To add fuel to the fire, coincidentally, the yearly World Cup of Pokemon was also starting right as the DLC came out. It would be trial by fire. You had to figure out the best new strategies with the new Pokemon immediately, otherwise you would get bumped out of the group stages. The 2020 World Cup of Pokemon metagame was defined by one word, momentum. The game was about getting in your powerful attackers as much as you could. Choice Bandit or Shifu Dark, Choice Bandit Rillaboom, they would all wreak havoc. To gain momentum, you would use other insane attackers like Heavy Duty Boot Cinderace or Choice Specs Magearna with Floor Cannon. In fact, these two were the most prominent attackers of the bunch because they were individually threatening while also having the pivot moves too. Get your attackers in the game and then let them go to work. It was also the birth of the iconic Future Port strategy. Future Sight plus Teleport is now a fundamental part of the Gen 8 competitive Pokemon scene, and it had its roots in the 2020 World Cup. And the strategy was to use Future Sight and then use Teleport to a powerful attacker. In Generation 8, there was a mechanic change which made Teleport always go last. With a high defense Pokemon like Slowbro, you could easily tank an attack, use Future Sight, tank another attack, and then teleport to a powerful attacker. That way the attacker is shielded from taking the hit, and Slowbro can regenerate her off the damage it took. Slowbro paired well with a number of powerful attackers. The most notable example was Slowbro plus fighting types like Urshifu Dark. Future Sight could destroy Pokemon like Toxapex who would try to switch into Urshifu's close combat. Besides these momentum-based offenses, Stall teams got much better with the release of Blissey. Blissey single-handedly shuts down a lot of special attacking Pokemon. Also, Magnezone with Magnet Pull was released, which opened up trapping strategies to try and trap Corviknight and Ferrothorn, two elite defensive Pokemon. Magnezone doesn't have hidden power fire in Generation 8, so it adapted and started to commonly use Iron Defense Body Press in order to trap and remove Ferrothorn. Tangrowth and Scizor were good defensive additions, and Volcarona joined the party as a devastating sweeper. Now with heavy duty boots, Volcarona became a nightmare to fight. It could run almost any moveset from Psychic to hit Toxapex, or even defensive Quiver Dance Safeguard Roost to protect against status conditions. It's out of vogue now, but Safeguard Volcarona trended up during the World Cup. Besides that, other strategies like Venusaur, Volcarona Sun were popular, and Grassy Terrain strategies were decent too. Magearna could use Grassy Seed Calm Mind and pair well with Rillaboom. Grassy Terrain weakens Earthquake and it can turn Magearna into a deadly sweeper. The World Cup would continue with Italy winning the World Cup of Pokemon in 2020, and after the World Cup, Cinderace and Magearna would both get banned. They both were unplayable and their raw power and momentum was too good. Cinderace's speed and power let it rack up damage with its Libero attacks and then U-turn out when the job's done. Then it could come back again later and do the same thing all over again. Magearna could do the same thing with Volt Switch and Floor Cannon. Very few Pokemon could switch into Floor Cannon and Cinderace and Magearna formed an intense Volt Turn combo. Magearna was banned through a public vote and Cinderace was quick banned with the intention of voting on it later to see if it could get unbanned. In the re-vote on Cinderace, Cinderace was voted to stay banned. Also of minor note, Zerud was released just after Cinderace and Magearna got banned. It wasn't too good overall, but it did have the niche of doing well versus stall teams at the time. Zerud had bulk up and jungle healing, which means it could heal itself from weak attackers while also being immune to status. 
Furthermore, its grass typing meant it could beat Quagsire, who was a popular, unaware Pokémon. The next few months were relatively uneventful. But other than the tangible changes, there became more of a focus on Heavy Duty Boots. Initially, Heavy Duty Boots was a cool idea and could be used on Stealth Rock weak Pokémon. But if hazards are so common, why not just use it on every Pokémon? People realized they could do that. Pokémon like Dragapult and Zerora started using Heavy Duty Boots and moves like U-Turn and Volt Switch respectively. Defensive Pokémon started using Heavy Duty Boots too, so that they could switch into attacks better. There was a mindset shift in just what could use Heavy Duty Boots, but this isn't necessarily a good thing. Hazards are a great way to make progress versus defensive teams. Maybe in a vacuum, a defensive Pokémon can take on your Pokémon 1v1. But when you start adding in hazards while switching in, it tips the scale towards offense. When defensive Pokémon can ignore hazards, it becomes much more difficult to punish switching. Is Heavy Duty Boots making defense too strong? That was a question at the time, and it's still a question to this day. Then, on October 22, 2020, the second DLC, The Crown Tundra, was released. DLC 2 added far more Pokémon than DLC 1, and a lot of the Pokémon they added were Legendaries and Ultra Beast Pokémon. Undoubtedly, at least some of these extremely powerful Pokémon would be banworthy. And in fact, some of these Pokémon were banned back in Generation 7. With all the new Pokémon, the overall power level increased, and some previously banned Pokémon were dropped back into OU because they might not be overpowered anymore. Kiram Black, Cinderace, Magearna, and Melmetal were all unbanned. The first part of the DLC 2 era would be about banning the new overpowered Pokémon. Over the next few months, Genesect, Naganadel, Landorus Eye, Kiram Black, Zygarde, Formosa, and interestingly Urshifu Dark would all get banned before that year's edition of Smogon Premier League. Ultimately though, after a series of votes, the public did find them to be too strong. First up is Genesect. Genesect has been banned in every generation it's been available in. Its powerful download ability turns it into a versatile threat where it can attack from any angle. In particular, its U-turn is incredibly strong and it's a supercharged version of Cinderace's U-turn. You have to prepare for all of Genesect's coverage options, but your best case scenario is to get hit by a U-turn as your opponent goes into a type advantage Pokémon. To add insult to injury, Genesect even had Shift Gear, which gave it an option as a sweeper Pokémon too. It was a no-brainer to ban Genesect, it's just a magnitude higher than anything in the OU tier. Similarly, Naganadel was simply too fast and too strong. With Nasty Plot and Beast Boost, Naganadel would almost always snowball out of control. Nasty Plot, Sludge Wave, Draco Meteor, and Fire Blast on that much speed and power was essentially unplayable. Every team basically had to use Heatran, whose Flash Fire ability makes it one of the few answers to Naganadel. It's not that Heatran is a bad Pokémon, but it's incredibly limiting when every team needs it. Landorus Eye follows the same trend, and it's another case of a Pokémon simply being too strong. Sheer Force Life Orb provides a ridiculous power boost on an already legendary Pokémon stat spread. It was basically too much to handle in every aspect. Landorus has a very large move pool, which means it can customize its moveset to beat any Pokémon it wants. Physical, special, mixed, it can do it all. Its 101 base speed conveniently outspeeds the base 100 speed tier, which is considered to be good. There's nothing really to say, it's a vanilla broken Pokémon. It's more than elite in sheer power, and above average in everything else. Next up is Kyurem Black, who you might remember from earlier in the video. Kyurem Black was already banned, but it was unbanned in DLC 2 because of all the new Steel-type Pokémon. Maybe it wouldn't be overpowered anymore. Unfortunately, it was. Even with all the new Steel-type Pokémon and Pokémon like Buzzwool, it was still a magnitude stronger than anything available. Never underestimate a 170 base attack. Next up is Zygarde, a legendary who is deceptively difficult to take down. Just like everything else on the list so far, it's been banned from Generation 7 and earlier. It becomes a powerful sweeper with either Dragon Dance or Coil, and Substitute protects it from status conditions. A key difference for Zygarde compared to other Ground-type Pokémon is that it doesn't need to run a different attacking move to hit Flying-type Pokémon. Thousand Arrows works on Flying-type Pokémon, and that frees up a move slot for Zygarde to do whatever it wants. The sheer strength of Zygarde and its sweeper movesets, coupled with its versatility, made it an overpowered Pokémon. 
Pheromotha is yet another example of a Pokemon being on a completely different power level compared to the rest of the tier. It's strong, fast, and has a good move pool. It can go either physical or special, and its versatility means it can choose what it wants to beat. The bad defenses on Pheromotha don't mean much when they outspeed everything and can knock Pokemon out before they get touched. These were the main overpowered legendaries to get banned. If anything, criticism was that it took too long to ban all these Pokemon. Urshifu Dark was banned one day before the start of Smogon Premier League that year. Even with all the new Fairy-type Pokemon, which we'll get into later, Urshifu could just nail them with Poison Jab. Between Wicked Blow, Close Combat, and Poison Jab, Urshifu could hit everything. The only counter was to hope you guessed the move right. It's interesting how Urshifu didn't get banned in the metagame before the Tapus came in. You would think that more fairy types would make a dark fighting type worse, but all the new fairy types made Mandibas and Como not very good. In the DLC 1 era, you could get by with Mandibas and a regen Pokemon, and while Urshifu was an excellent Pokemon, it was never suspected for a ban. Then, during Smogon Premier League, Spectre, Cinderace, and Magearna would all get banned. Smogon Premier League goes by weeks, so it's not a big deal if something gets banned mid-tournament. It just means that future weeks won't have that banned Pokemon and you have to adapt. Spectre was fast and strong with Nasty Plot and Grimne. However, it wasn't initially considered to be overpowered because of how one-dimensional it was. It didn't have a good attacking move pool, which meant that any normal or dark type could beat it 1v1. But then, people started adapting and running Will-O-Wisp substitute Spectre. Willow and defensive EVs means that Spectre can actually beat certain Dark-type Pokémon like Mandibuzz. That adaptation was crucial. When even Dark-types couldn't beat Spectre, people started to realize that it was overpowered and people voted to ban it. Cinderace and Magearna were unbanned with DLC 2 because maybe they wouldn't be overpowered. However, they still were and they were banned again for the same reasons as before. DLC 1 changed the meta, but it wasn't a really radical shift. On the other hand, DLC 2 was definitely a huge shift and added so many staples to the metagame, even after the initial bans. First, the addition of the Tapu Pokémon were massive. With the exception of Tapu Bulu, because Rillaboom is a better grassy terrain Pokémon, every Tapu became mainstream threats. They removed the reliance the meta had on Clefable as a Fairy-type Pokémon. They all opened up terrain strategies and were individually good Pokémon in their own right. Tapu Koko added a lot of speed to the metagame, Tapu Lele added a lot of power, and Tapu Fini added a lot of support. Then came the Genie Trio. Tornadus Lariat has always been an elite Pokémon with its speed and power. Now in Gen 8 it came with Heavy Duty Boots too. The Elephant in the Room, Landorus T, also became very popular. Landorus T gets a lot of criticism from the casual player base. Why isn't it banned? Landorus is often the most used Pokémon in the tier, yet it's never once been considered for a ban. The idea is that it's used a lot, but who cares? Usage does not make something overpowered. Landorus T is used a lot because it's close to a perfect support Pokémon. It has Intimidate, a good move pool, a good typing, and good stats. But it's never unplayable. Landorus T is never going to run a team over, and it's not shutting down team options. It is the team option. That makes it very different from an example like Gothitelle, who would literally shut down teams. Landorus T is versatile and can do many things and fit on many playstyles, but it's not overpowered. Garchomp joined the tier and also got Scale Shot in Generation 8. That meant it had a good Dragon-type attack without having to lock itself into Outrage. Garchomp became useful as a defensive Stealth Rocker with its good typing, or as a powerful Swords Dance Sweeper with Earthquake and Scale Shot. It's interesting to contrast Garchomp with Salamence, who is also released in DLC 2. Salamence is not very good because unlike Garchomp, it doesn't have a good secondary type to hit fairy types. Dual Wing Beat is a lot weaker than Earthquake. Almost paradoxically though, Dragonite became a good sweeper with its Dragon and Flying type because of multi-scale and heavy-duty boots. Multi-scale and boots meant it could use Dragon Dance Roost movesets to stay healthy and powerful. It does have the same flying stab issue as Salamence, but multi-scale makes it so much better overall that it's worth using. Dragonite could even run a defensive roost moveset with Heal Bell or Defog or even both. Heatran became one of the best Pokémon in the tier with its typing and stats. Magma Swarm is also an elite move because it's able to trap Pokémon. It's extremely good, 
but it's still a magnitude below abilities that can trap because having to make a move takes one turn and the opponent can react to that. The more things change, the more they stay the same, and the Pokemon that were good in Generation 7 came back and fit right in. Zapdos, Kartana, Buzzwole, and Blacephalon were all welcomed back to the tier as powerful Pokemon that weren't quite overpowered. Slowking Galar was the most impactful new Pokemon, adding an excellent poison type that could combat all the fairy type Pokemon. But there's also one more Pokemon that became relevant, and it's the story of the ugly duckling that no one believed in. Arctozolt. At the time of release, Arctozolt was a ZU tiered Pokemon. It was at the very bottom. But in DLC 2, it got the ability Slush Rush. Slowly, it started rising up the ranks, moving up tier after tier, with more people realizing how good it was. Arctozolt's electric and ice combination is inherently good because, for example, ice can hit ground types who would ordinarily wall electric. But it's even better than that because it has Bolt Beak, which doubles power like Fish's Rend. Previously, Arctozolt was always too slow to ever use Bolt Beak effectively, but now with Slush Rush, Bolt Beak plus Blizzard became a terrifying combination. Because of Arctozolt, it was Hail teams that were becoming really popular. Also, after the Magearna ban, Weavile started emerging as one of the top Pokemon. Knockoff is always good, especially in a tier full of heavy duty boots. Weavile matched up well versus common Pokemon like Landorus and Garchomp too. Heavy Duty Boots Weavile could consistently come in games and always provide value with its speed and knockoff. Sword Dance on that speed tier made it particularly deadly. Furthermore, it synergized well with Future Sight and other momentum based strategies. Anything that could U turn or Volt Switch to bring in Weavile worked well, but Future Sight plus Teleport was amazing because Future Sight could target Pokemon like Buzzwool or Toxapex who would normally wall Weavile. Over time, Weavile would get more and more common as one of the tier's best attacking Pokemon. After Smogon Premier League in April of 2021, there was an interesting public vote on dropping Zamazenta Crowned into OU. An embarrassing moment for the cover legendary community, but Zamazenta was really bad. The question was, would it be bad enough to stop being an Uber's Pokemon? Could it really be that bad to be allowed in standard play? That's never happened to a cover legendary before. Zamazenta is a statistically strong Pokemon but has too many drawbacks. It's forced to hold Rusted Shield as a held item and it doesn't have any good boosting moves or recovery moves. With its high defense and speed, it would be able to stop a lot of powerful offensive Pokemon, but because of its low attack and inability to boost it, it would also get stopped by a lot of Pokemon. Zamazenta could act as a check to powerful threats like Kartana, Weavile, Tornadus T, or Melmetal. But because it couldn't recover HP, it would be skill based to try and find a way to wear it down. It would also add a switch into knockoff and trick, which doesn't exist in Generation 8 without Mega Pokemon or Z moves. Zamazenta also gets walled by common defensive Pokemon like Toxapex or Corviknight. The idea was to drop a Pokemon that could be an offensive pivot that could provide defensive utility while not being overbearingly strong. However, the opponents of the idea who wanted it to stay banned so that even if these flaws are true, it's still a magnitude stronger through sheer stats alone. Its teammates can help it out too. For example, Future Sight plus Zamazenta is a potent attacking core. They argued that Zamazenta would slow the game down because teams would need to run Toxapex style defensive teams to even deal with Zamazenta. Regular offenses would struggle too much with it. Every offensive team would need a Pokemon like Volcarona to handle Zamazenta. Ultimately, in a public vote, Zamazenta indeed remained banned from OU, receiving a 75% ban vote. Definitely one of the more interesting tests in recent memory. After the Zamazenta ban, the meta developed as normal. In this year's World Cup, US South ended up winning. Because there are so many players in the United States, the country is split into regions. After the World Cup was a yearly tournament known as OLT, the official ladder tournament. In this tournament, you qualify for playoffs by getting the high scores on the Pokemon Showdown ladder in the given amount of time. On the ladder were a lot of people using hyper-offensive teams built around King's Rock, Shell Smash, Cloyster. King's Rock applies a flinch chance to every hit, which means Cloyster's moves like Icicle Spear and Rock Blast have an effective 41% chance to flinch. This isn't overpowered, but it does introduce a lot of luck. Shell Smash Cloyster will gain enough speed to almost always outspeed your Pokemon. Even if you have the best defensive Pokemon in the game, you can still get flinched down by Cloyster. King's Rock was essentially an item that only added luck to the game, not skill. 
If you're playing in-game versus gym leaders and NPCs, stuff like that is fun and is part of the game. But if you're trying to make a game as competitive as possible, you don't want items that only add luck. You want the better player to win, whatever that means. Eventually, King's Rock and other pure luck strategies like Bright Powder, Sand Veil, and Snow Cloak were all banned, thus ending the Cloister Menace era of OLT. As the months passed, Kurum was becoming increasingly popular and increasingly ban-worthy in the eyes of many people. With Generation 8, Kurum got Heavy Duty Boots, Freeze Dry to hit Water-type Pokémon, and Dragon Dance Icicle Spear to be a physical attacker too, if it wanted to. Kurum was running a lot of different movesets, from Choice Specs to Heavy Duty Boots, with Substitute and Roost. Sub Roost Kurum was quite popular because with Pressure and Substitute, you could stall out a lot of moves like Stone Edge in close combat. The freedom to switch moves means that Freeze Dry and Earth Power hit most of the tier. Dragon Dance Icicle Spear Kurum was a good surprise option to defeat special walls and can actually beat Toxapex 1v1 through PP Stall. Kurum's power was a lot less overt than something like Naganadel. Pressure and Roost combined with Kurum's high special attack made it deceptively hard to deal with. With just a few customizations to its moveset, Kurum could choose what does and doesn't beat it. It had immediate power and PP stalling capabilities. The unique combination of its skill set meant that in the long run it could beat down a lot of teams. You likely would have to use more than one answer to Kurum in order to cover all its different possibilities. On December 13th, 2021, one year after the release of DLC 2, Kurum was finally banned through a public vote. The Kurum ban entered the endgame and what I call the post-Kurum era. The Kurum ban was unique because it had been in the tier for a long time. It formed common cores with a lot of Pokemon and was an essential part of the fabric of the metagame. It wasn't like Genesect ripping through a team and getting banned quickly. Kurum was on a lot of teams as a wall breaker or support Pokemon. Structures of teams could change completely because you didn't have to deal with Kurum anymore, like you did for the past year and a half. One example is the rise of Slow Bro instead of Slow King. Slow King was the better of the pair while Kurum was around because its high special defense let it tank moves like Freeze Dry. Without Kurum, Slow Bro became a better option to deal with a large number of physical attackers like Melmetal and Urshifu Rapid. With Kurum banned, we enter the metagame that we have right now, for the most part anyway. This time in 2022, France would win the World Cup, the final World Cup before the end of the generation. With the generation ending, it was time to take a look back. No one wanted to really do anything drastic to the metagame as it finishes. Toxifex for its stalling ability, Heavy Duty Boots, and Melmetal were all somewhat controversial. The last public vote would be of Melmetal. Melmetal was receiving a lot of heat for many of the same reasons that it had before. However, with all the new Pokémon, there were far more answers to Melmetal. Double Iron Bash is undoubtedly strong, but there were Pokémon like Buzzwool, Corviknight, Skarmory, Slowbro, Zapdos, Rotom Wash, and more to handle Melmetal. Furthermore, a lot of people didn't want to shake up the metagame by banning a common Pokémon that was also keeping in check other powerful Pokémon like Weavile. If Melmetal were to get banned, would Weavile be overpowered too? Who knows? But people didn't want to find out anyway when Melmetal, in the eyes of many, was not even ban-worthy either. On October 28th, 2022, Melmetal received only a 14% ban vote, which was the smallest ban vote in recent memory. And that's where it ends. Pokémon Scarlet and Violet would come out on November 18th, ending the modern Generation 8 metagame. So how would you describe the Gen 8 metagame as it stands? Well, I'll let the person who's been a big part of OU answer that, Finchinator. His channel is in the pinned comment below and he's been influential in these tiering decisions, so I'll let him talk about where the metagame stands right now. Hey guys, what's up? It's Finchinator here, the tier leader of Generation 8 OU, coming into Generation 9 OU. Hope you guys had a great time playing Generation 8. Personally, I really did. There were surely some ups and downs, but when it was all said and done, we really saw a more proactive, fun, offensively oriented metagame with a bit less stall. Yes, there was Regenerator and Balance, but to counteract it, we had a lot of hard hitters and things to abuse that like Future Sight and Magma Storm. Seeing Pokemon like Heatran take their natural place to top OU, no surprise, alongside some really strong ground types like Garchomp and Landris. And topping it all off, new additions to the tier like Dragapult have really been awesome. Things like Heavy Duty Boots, while controversial, have also been really fun. Overall, I've had a great time this generation, and I really like where the tiers ended up. I hope you guys had fun too. 
really excited to keep going and playing Generation 9. I'll be uploading some on my channel if you want to check that out, but I'll bring you back to Freeze Eye now. Thank you so much for having me. When you watch this video, the meta might have changed since last described. Even when a tier is not the current generation, people play the tier in tournaments and innovations may slow down, but they don't stop. It could very well be that when you're watching this, the metagame could be different than what I've described to you so far. And finally, from humble beginnings with a limited Pokedex, to Pokemon Home and two DLCs expanding the tier, with controversies and tournaments, that is the complete history of competitive Generation 8 Pokemon in singles. Thank you all for watching, this was probably my biggest project ever, and I'm happy with the way it turned out. See you all in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet.